Good morning. This is Steve again from Southern Illinois. We've had a nice week of rain and gray and mud and cold. And last night got down in the 20s and was nice and frosty this morning. There's smoke coming out my chimney, but the sun is shining. It's supposed to be up in the mid 40s today, so it's looking like a great day. It was with the best of times, it was the worst of times. I was 10 years old and my family had just moved from the high desert of New Mexico to Kansas. And my brother and I thought we were in heaven. I mean, there were actually trees that we could climb. Now you don't think of Texas as being a land of trees, but when you move there from the middle of the desert in New Mexico, <laughs> we lived in a veritable forest. We lived in a real house. Mom and Dad had bought a new refrigerator, a new um, stove, we still had the same old ringer washing machine down in the basement, but we had a basement. And we, Tom and I uh, were actually going to school. And for the first time in our lives, we had somebody other than mom or dad as our teacher. And most exciting of all, dad had gone out and bought us a real car. Okay? I mean... Well, it was used, okay? It was a used police car, but it had a, 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 a spotlight on the, the, the driver's side. You could reach out through the window and you could adjust it and it, could actually, it actually worked. Oh man, it was the coolest car. And best of all, <laughs> it wasn't held together with snips of wire from barbed wire fences and uh, the gas tank didn't have to be soaked with ivory soap to keep it from leaking every three weeks. There was a lot of new stuff. Then Christmas came around. This was the first time in my life that I could remember living within driving distance of family at Christmas time and um, mom and dad announced to us that we were going to go visit grandma for Christmas oh man this was so cool we were so excited but then the night before we were supposed to leave it was only a five-hour drive it wasn't really a long long ways but the night before we were supposed to leave Mom and Dad went into their bedroom and closed the door, and that was never a good sign for my brother and I. That meant there was a discussion going on, and we could hear murmur murmured voices behind the door. They weren't happy voices. But finally, Mom came out. She called us into our bedroom, and she sat us down, and, and um, she said, Boys, um... We've bought you some presents for Christmas. And immediately our eyes open wide and our ears perked up because presents, plural? Wow! We had never had more than one present for Christmas ever. We were going to get presents, plural? Then why was she looking so unhappy? She said, we bought you some presents, but things have been tight. All of this new stuff is costing money and, and, and the finances are really tight right now. So we haven't been able to get you big presents. And at this point, Tom and I are kind of a little confused. We've never had big presents. What's the big deal with that? And then she puts out the clinker. She says, and we're embarrassed to have you open them in front of the family. We're afraid that you won't be happy.
happy with them if you, when you see what everybody else is getting. Oh, come on, Mom. We're going to be happy with our presents. Christmas, give already. Finally, she pulled it out. She pulled out a plain old shoebox. All of our presents that Christmas fit inside of that plain old shoebox. And we opened the shoebox up and there were matched sets of a bunch of presents. I remember matchbox toys. We each got a, match, a matchbox car. Um, they were different and we had to choose, but we each got a car. And uh, there were these toys, I don't know what you call them, but you had this wheel on a, a magnetized spindle and then you had this wire loop and you could roll it and the wheel would start spinning and it would go down and then the momentum of the spinning would bring it back up the other side and then it would roll down and you just had to keep tilting it. Oh, we played with those for hours. I don't remember all of the toys that were in there. Okay, the only other toy that I remember being in there were these two sickly green plastic eggs with the word silly putty embossed on the outside of it. I had never seen silly putty before in my life. Mom had to explain what we did with it. Um, and it sounded kind of silly. Well, you, you take it and you squeeze it and you make it into shapes. And then she said something that really got our attention. And it glows in the dark. She had bought us each an egg of glow in the dark silly putty. Now, how cool was that? Vivian has these questions that she's famous for. We call them Vivian questions in our social circle. Okay, anytime that we're at a social gathering and the conversation starts to lag to her perception, she pulls out one of her Vivian questions. And one of her favorites around Christmas time is, tell me about the best Christmas present you ever received and the worst. It's always sure to, cut, to, to bring out some stories that bring laughter or tears. But you know, when she asks that question, I always have a single answer. My shoebox Christmas. Because that Christmas taught me the value of giving presents to those you love, even when it requires sacrifice. That's the best Christmas gift I ever got. But that Christmas is also the Christmas that I realized that the gifts my mom and dad gave me didn't measure up to the standard of the commercialized, over-the-top Santa promise that is promoted in our Western culture. After that, Christmas never measured up. I mean, my dad didn't give me a car for my 16th birthday. You know? I asked for and didn't get. What is spirituality? The broadest definition that I've found is that spirituality consists of the ways that we experience or express or seek meaning and purpose in our lives. It's a question that religious people often struggle with. What is spirituality after all? Because in their minds, it's all blended right in with their religious experience. Religious experiences are a part of spirituality, but they're not the sum total. And while in American culture, it's popular for us to say that we're spiritual, 
but not religious. We're ambivalent even about spirituality. I work in healthcare and in hospitals in their credentialing with the the uh, stan standards committee, the the organizations that come around and grade hospitals on the quality of care that they deliver. One of the elements that they're graded on is spiritual care. And yet, when we do surveys, only 50% of people are open to any discussion or form of spiritual care, even in end-life situations, much less in routine doctor's visits. 80% of physicians that are surveyed in intensive care units acknowledge that spiritual care is a part of their responsibility. But only 14% report actually acting on that sense of responsibility. We're ambivalent about this, and it shows in our practice. And the results are measurable. In one survey of intensive care unit patients and their families, if the patient or family reported that they had received a low level of spiritual or religious support during the hospitalization, the patient was more likely to have died, less likely to have been referred for hospice care, where spiritual care becomes primary, and they spent more money in their last week of life. All of which has resulted in research into how we can increase and improve spiritual care in health systems. But while doctors and hospitals struggle with this, in my experience, this isn't unique to them. This is something that all of us struggle with. Uh, I have, I live in a small neighborhood. We're about three miles out of town, but they're about, there's a cluster of about 10 houses here. Many of my neighbors attend church. We share religion as a priority in our lives. But I couldn't tell you what church they attend we don't talk about it. I have other people in my life that I perceive as living good, moral, upright lives. They're good people. But I never hear them talking about church, and I assume they're spiritual but not religious, but I don't know that because we never talk about it. ambivalence. COVID has forced us into a situation where this ambivalence is preventing us from doing something very important. Just over a week ago in the United States, we passed the quarter million mark in deaths due to COVID. And while we're still arguing about whether that's the real number, one thing is crystal clear. A lot of people are dying. In fact, mid -October, by mid-October, compared to the, the years in the past decade, more than 300,000 people extra had died in the United States by that point in the year. That's a lot of people. That's the equivalent of wiping out the entire town of, of St. Louis or Pittsburgh or Cincinnati. Boom! Off the map in the last six to eight months. If we're not talking to each other about spiritual matters now, when will we? If we're not supporting each other spiritually, helping each other find meaning and purpose in life, 
When will we? Purpose and meaning are critical elements in maintaining resilience in difficult times. That's why I'm bearing my soul to you each week. I'm trying to support you. This isn't a religious obligation for me. I want you to care more deeply for each other, to love more selflessly, to be resilient in the face of the uncertainty and the difficulties that we're facing as a world today. Which is why this week when I stumbled onto an article in my one of my medical journals that dealt precisely with this question, I got excited. Okay. And it didn't just say, wring its hands and say, oh my goodness, we've got to care more, provide more spiritual care to people. No, it provided a concrete, simple list of Vivian questions that can be used to initiate conversations, meaningful conversations with friends, neighbors, family, acquaintances about spiritual matters. And it's easy to remember. I'll put a link in the comments, uh, both on Facebook and uh, on the YouTube channel. I'll put a link to the actual article so you can read this. But for right now, let me just give you a summary. It uses the acronym HOPE. H. Can you identify any sources of hope and strength that are meaningful for you in difficult times? That's not a threatening question. When you see somebody struggling, asking that question both opens the door for them to think about and to talk about the sources of hope and strength that they have found in their lives and also gives them a chance to share them with you and you to join them in that. O, organized. Do you practice a specific organized religion or a set of spiritual beliefs that you find supportive in difficult times. This takes it from a discussion of sources of strength to the religious and spiritual context within which they operate. P, personal. What personal religious or spiritual practices do you have and find value in? This moves us from theory to practice, from belief to how we live our lives. And then E, how can I incorporate your spiritual beliefs or practices to best support you? How can I support you? Now, if you're religious, I looked at this list and, and I was like, uh, 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 but, 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 but what about religious beliefs? There's all these things that we're supposed to teach people in these times. Crisis is a time when people are willing to listen to the gospel. And that's true. That's true. Uh, drowning men will grasp at straws. And when we are in crisis, we're more willing to listen to anybody who says they have a solution. But sometimes I think we religious people, and it doesn't, it's not unique to my denomination or to Christians, or to even members of organized religions, sometimes we religious people assume that the other person is drowning in the water and fail to recognize that they're actually sitting in a lifeboat out there in the storm, just like we are. And it's like we're telling them, hey, you're in the water, when they 
are experiencing sitting in a lifeboat. I know, it's an analogy, and it may not quite work for you, but it bespeaks the disrespect that we have for the experience of others. And these Vivian questions, I found a value because they approach initiating conversations f with an assumption of respect for the other person's experience. I can't think of a better way to form friendships. And you know, in friendships, sharing happens. We will have a chance to share our side of the story. And that's true whether we're spiritual and not religious, or spiritual and religious, or just religious, okay? Um, I think there's some value here. Play with it and see what you think. Last year, around Christmas time, Vivian and I were driving down the road, and a pickup was in front of us. And uh, all of a sudden, this box blew out of the back of the pickup and landed on the floor and just exploded into a shower of almost like confetti of strips of Christmas wrapping paper and ribbons and all of all sorts of other stuff. Now the pickup continued down the road in front of us. I don't think they even knew they lost it. But I break to a stop, you know, thinking that somebody may have lost their Christmas presents, walked back and all I found was Yeah, the leftovers from opening Christmas presents. But they're hidden in the midst of all of these scraps of, of torn Christmas wrap was this little red plastic egg. And on the outside of it, you're not going to be able to see it, but on the outside of it, it has embossed the words, Silly Putty. That's right. After all these years, I found another egg full of silly putty. And you know, the nostalgia of that Christmas all those years ago just, just made it impossible for me to throw that egg of silly putty away. Everything else got stuffed back in the box. I found a garbage can and I threw it in, okay? But this silly putty, which somebody else had discarded, came to my house, and it sits in our living room. And, and um, very frequently now, I end up pulling it out, sitting down in a chair while Vivian's knitting. We may carry on a conversation, we may not. But I find myself just kneading the silly putty, and as, as it warms up, it goes from stiff to being much more pliable, and you can... You can uh, squeeze it or roll it into different shapes and patterns and, you know, pretend you've got glasses on. You know, it's kind of like a worry stone, which is a spiritual practice, something that calms us and allows us to think more clearly. But it's more than that for me. It brings back the memories of that Christmas and the lessons I learned, the value of giving gifts of love, the importance of not being influenced by negative patterns in the culture around us. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. What's in your shoebox? Have a good week, my friends. Be safe. Hospitals aren't quite as overwhelmed here in Southern Illinois right now. But we have a new crisis. Over 30% of our ambulance crews are out with COVID right now. So sometimes it takes six to 10 hours before we can get an ambulance to transfer patients for the care. So be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you next week.